Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity we have to look into your word. We ask that you'll speak to our hearts and minds as we continue to look at this subject matter within this sanctuary. Uh, this, looking at the sanctuary message, we ask that you will speak, speak to every listener, give us understanding. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're continuing our series looking at types and shadows, a biblical look at the sanctuary message. And today, tonight, we're looking at a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. So who were called to the priesthood? Who were called to the priesthood? We're going to Exodus chapter 28, verse 1. Who were called to the priesthood? Let's see what the Bible says here. Exodus 28, verse 1, the Bible says, And take thou unto thee Aaron thy brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office, even Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithmar, Aaron's son. So these were the individuals called to the priesthood, Aaron and his descendants, his sons. Numbers 18 verse 7 says, Therefore thou and thy sons with thee shall keep your priest's office for everything of the altar and within the veil, and ye shall serve. I have given your priest's office unto you as a service of gift, and the stranger that cometh nigh shall be put to death. So God specifically called Aaron and his sons to the priesthood ministry. Now let's go to Exodus 29. Exodus 29, looking at verse 29 and 30. Exodus 29, verses 29 and 30. The Bible says, And the holy garments of Aaron shall be his sons after him, to be anointed therein, and to be consecrated in them. And the son, and that son that is priest in his stead shall put them on seven days when he cometh into the tabernacle of the congregation to minister in the holy place. So once again, the, the individual is called to the priesthood, which includes the regular priest and also the high priest were Aaron and his sons. When Aaron died, one of his sons would uh, typically would be the oldest would come next in line to be the high priest. So the high priest was Aaron. The priests were Nadab, Babihu, Eleazar, and Ithmar. Now you read um, in the scripture that Nadab and Abihu were slain by the Lord because they offered strange fire. So they were actually slain, and eventually it was just only two of Aaron's sons, Eleazar and Ithmar. So the priests were of the tribe of Levi. That's in Exodus 6, verse 16 to 20. Aaron was a Levite. He and his sons were to serve as priests. The other Levites, you know, those who are not descendants of Aaron, those who were also Levites in the same tribe, they assisted the priest work. This is coming from the book, The Sanctuary Service by M. L. Andreessen. It says the priest had control of the entire outward worship of the nation. They were the custodians of the temple and they only could draw near to God an expression which in Israel meant the privilege of officiating at the altar and entering the sanctuary to perform the services there. Only through them could the people have access to the blessings of the covenant symbolized by the sprinkling of the blood and the offering of incense. The priest alone could transact with God. Aside from their strictly religious functions and the temple ritual, the priest also had control of many civil and even personal matters. They determined when a man was ceremonially unclean and had power to exclude him from the congregation. And of course, during this period of time, they, the nation of Israel was under a theocracy where God was the one who was ruling. And so he worked through the priest in making uh, various decisions. So 
This is coming from the Sanctuary Service, ML Andreessen, page 14. So now the question is, because God had raised up these priests to be the custodians, to be in charge of, of, of the worship of God, to be the custodians of the temple, to, to, to be the custodians of these sacred oracles, has God called his people to be priest for him. Go to Exodus chapter 19, verses five through six. Exodus 19, verses five through six. And let's see what the Bible says here in Exodus 19, verses five through six. The Bible says, Now therefore, if ye will, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Verse 6, and ye shall be unto me, this is God speaking to his people Israel, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So God called his people to be a royal priesthood, to be a peculiar people, a holy nation. First Peter two, verse nine, speaking in terms of his church in, the la in, in these last days. And first Peter two, verse nine says, Be ye are a chosen generation, a what? Royal priesthood. What else? A holy nation, a peculiar people that we should do what? That we should show forth the praises of him, pointing people to the true God, to true worship, who called who have called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God has called us, his people, to be a royal priesthood, a holy nation. How are we to do this? Let's look at the attire of the priesthood, specifically the regular priest. We're going to look at the high priest at another time, but we want to look at just the regular priest. What was the attire of the regular priest? Exodus 39. And we're going to look at verses 27 through 29. Exodus 39, 27 through 39. The Bible says, 27 to 29. Exodus 39, verses 27 to 29. It says, And they made coats of fine linen of woven work for Aaron and for his sons, and a mitre of fine linen, and goodly bonnets of fine linen, and linen breeches of fine twine linen and a girdle of fine twine linen and blue and purple and scarlet of needlework as the Lord commanded Moses. So they were clothed, brothers and sisters, we see the, the priest were clothed in this fine twine linen, which is white. We studied this already in this series. They were clothed in this fine twi twine linen, which means bleached white in the original Hebrew. So they were in white. And this white, as we studied before, points to the righteousness of Christ. So in order to be a part of God's royal priesthood, we must be clothed in the righteousness of Christ. The only way we can show forth the praises of him who have called us out of darkness into his marvelous light, we must be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Very important. And that happens when we come to Christ just as we are, repent, confess our sins, receive Christ into our lives. And when we receive Christ as Lord and Savior of our lives, he justifies us. He clothes us with his righteousness. And then we have to walk in the newness of life, living a holy life through the power of Christ dwelling in us through the Holy Spirit. And so we must be clothed in Christ's righteousness in order to be a part of this royal priesthood. The Bible says in Jeremiah 23, verse six, in his days, Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is the name whereby he shall be called. What, how will Judah be saved? How will God's people, how will you and I be saved? It says, this is the name whereby he shall be called. The Lord, what? Our righteousness. Because remember, 
Your righteousness is as filthy rags. We must not be clothed in our righteousness. You must not be clothed in your righteousness. We must be clothed in Christ's righteousness, which is pure, holy, and spotless. Philippians 3 verse 8, Paul speaking here to the church of Philippi. Philippians 3 verse 8, the Bible says, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Verse 9, And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. That's the only way we're going to be a royal priesthood in these last days, being clothed with Christ's righteousness by faith, his life being lived out in us and through us. Romans 13 verse 14 says, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to understand, we don't put them on just once a week. We got to put them on on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and on the seventh day, Saturday. Every single day, we have to put on Christ. Just like when we uh, go about our day, we got to, as we are getting ready to go about our day, we got to put on our clothes. We got to put on not only our physical clothes, we got to put on our spiritual garment, which is the righteousness of Jesus. And when we put it on the righteousness of Christ, we're putting on Christ. And so the Bible says in Romans 13, verse 14, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and what? Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. So in order to be a part of this royal priesthood, you got to be clothed in Christ's righteousness. Put on Jesus Christ, not just once a week, every single day, and don't make provision for the flesh. you got to be like Job, brothers and sisters. The Bible says in Job, that Job chapter 1, that Job feared God and that he ensued evil. Ensued means he avoided evil. And that's what we got to do in these last days. In this time uh, 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 where there's a grand, where there's a lot of lots of delusions and deceptions and and temptations all around us, we have to be just like that, ensuing and avoiding evil and putting on the righteousness of Christ. Now, righteous how? How can we be righteous? By whose power are we righteous? So, how is this righteousness demonstrated? Psalm 119, verse 172. My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are what? Righteousness. So when we are clothed with Christ's righteousness, we will live a righteous life in keeping what? God's commandments, which are righteousness. Go to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. I mentioned this as I was speaking already, but we're going to read from the scripture in John 1, verses 12 and 13. This is what happens when we receive Christ, because that's the only way we can exemplify this righteousness in keeping God's commandments, which is righteousness. John 1, verses 12 and 13 says, but as many as received him to them gave you what? Power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which are born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. When we receive Christ, we receive power to become sons and daughters of God. And so the Bible also says, Colossians 1 verse 27, it says, to whom God will make known what is the riches of the glory, what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is what? Christ in you, the same Christ you receive. He, 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 you receive power when you receive Christ, right? What type of power is this? It says, to whom God will make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is what? Christ in you, the hope of glory, the hope of glory. The Bible lets us know in Exodus 33 and Exodus 34, Moses asked God, Lord, I beg of you, show me your glory. God says, okay, I'll make all my goodness pass before you and I'll proclaim the name of the Lord. I'll put you in the cliff of a rock and cover you with my hand as I pass by. You will see my, you will see my back, but you can't see my face. So God gave Moses a glimpse of his 
physical glory, but not only his physical glory, but also his spiritual glory, which and when you read in the original Hebrew, that word name, because Moses said, Lord, I beg you, show me your glory. God says, I'll proclaim my name before you. And he did that in Exodus 34. It says he proclaimed the name of the Lord. That word name means character. So God's, so not only was Moses, not only was God's physical glory revealed to Moses, but also his spiritual glory, his name or his character. And so when the Bible says in Colossians 1 27, Christ in you, the hope of glory is Christ in you, the hope of reflecting his character fully. That's the power you receive. And Christ dwells in us through the agency of the Holy Ghost. And so we read in Acts 1 verse 8, Acts 1 verse 8, but ye shall receive what? Power. After that, the what? Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. But see, we not only must just be clothed, but we have to keep our garments. Revelation 16, verse 15 says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. We got to maintain this walk with God. We got to keep our garments. Stay clothed in the righteousness of Christ. So the priest covered their nakedness, my friends. We read in the scriptures how they uh, had breeches under their, their robes. They covered their nakedness. So how does God want his people to dress? Just like the priests were covered, God wants his people to be covered. Remember, we are a chosen generation, a what? Royal priesthood. And this righteousness that dwells within automatically will be reflected without. Let me say it again. The righteousness of Christ, when you receive Christ, that righteousness that is within will be reflected without. So your spiritual garments will be, ref will, your, 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 your spiritual garments will shine out and be manifested as well in your physical garments. And so the Bible says in 1 Timothy 2, verse 9 and 10, talking about God's people, his royal priesthood, his, the, the people who are to be a holy nation, not just talking holiness, but making sure that they are dressing holy. Uh-oh. Oh, yeah, we're touching on this, friends. We are touching on this. Dress reform. 1 Timothy 2, verse 9 and 10 says, In like manner also the women adorn themselves in what kind of apparel? What type of clothing? Modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. Not with broaded hair or gold or pearls or costly array. Not taking yourself with jewels and jewelry. Not dressing immodestly. This is the scripture. And so for those who say I'm a New Testament Christian, this is New Testament. It says, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. Not with broaded hair or gold or pearls or costly array but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. So women should adorn themselves in what type of apparel? Modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. That's what we read at 1 Timothy 2 verse 9. The Greek word eidos that is translated as with shamefacedness means a sense of shame. Hmm. A woman is not to have a negative attitude of shame towards her own body, but a healthy sense of shame attached with revealing her form to the view of others are drawing undue attention to her appearance. That's what that scripture means. You ought to have a healthy sense of shame attached to revealing your form. You're, you're not trying to show it. You're not trying to show the thigh or the legs. You're not trying to show the cleavage because you have same faceness. 
Isaiah 47, verse 2 and 3. Take the millstones and grind the mill. Uncover the locks. Make bare the what? We're talking about nakedness now. We're having a shamefacedness. We're not going to uncover certain things in our body. So the Bible describes to us nakedness. Look, you, do you want to know the biblical, what, it, what the Bible means when, it, when it's dealing with nakedness? Do you want to see it? Do, do you want to know what the scripture says? We're going to give you the word of God and show you how you need to have shamefacedness. That you're not, you, 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 you feel shame when you, you don't want to reveal that which should be covered. And so notice what the Bible says about nakedness. Take the millstone and grind meal. Isaiah 47, 2 and 3. Uncover the locks. Make bare the what? Leg. Uncover the what? Thigh. So when you're exposing your legs and your thighs, you're revealing your nakedness. Ooh. It goes on. Pass over the rivers. Thy what? Nakedness shall be uncovered. Yea, thy what? Shame. Do you read in 1 Timothy 2 verse 9? Shame faceness. Thy shame shall be seen. Your nakedness. Your overcover your leg, your thigh, short, your cleavage. I will take vengeance and I will not meet thee as a man. Nakedness is shameful. We are uh, uncovering certain things that should be covered. It's shameful. Exodus 34, uh, excuse me, Exodus 32. Exodus 32 verse 25 says, And when Moses saw the, that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their what? Shame among their enemies. Are you seeing this from the word of God? We're talking about being a royal priesthood, a holy nation, not just on the inside, but even on the outside, because that which is on the inside will be reflected outwardly. And let me just put a disclaimer out here, because a lot of times we start on the outside without working on the inside. You got to start with the inside first. You got to receive Christ into your life. And when you receive Christ into your life and his righteousness will be reflected out, not only in what you say and, 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 and in, in the things that you do, but even how you dress. Hope you understand it. I want to show you a, a, uh, um, Pretty much, this is a chart showing how the dress among women has changed over the years. See, from 1870 to 1910, the skirts were not dragging, the waists were not compressed, as you can see. But then a change began to happen. Get past 1910. 1920. It's not too bad, but then 1930. Okay. But then 1940. Notice how just this is just look at this. From 1870 to 1910. Look at the level of the dress, how long it is. Then you get to 1920, they just raise it up a little bit. 1930, just a little bit more, kind of change the style up a little bit. But then 1940, boom. It went up even higher. 1950, got that woman in some pants. Hmm. The next four decades made startling changes to the hemlines. You get it? Pants and tailor suits were becoming popular in the 1950s among women. Let's look at the mini skirt. Does God consider the length of the skirt important? 
Remember we, what we looked at from the word of God about nakedness and shamefacedness and how nakedness, uh, when you're naked, is shame. You're revealing your shame. Notice this. This is Mary. It's about Mary Quant. She's the one that invented the miniskirt. It says this in the last half of the 1960s, we moved from the 50s. Now we're in the 60s. In the last half of the 1960s, a London fashion designer named Mary Quant introduced the miniskirt into fashion. Because as she said at the time, she liked to go to bed with a man in the afternoon and didn't want to take her clothes off. This is the event of the miniskirt. You see her motivation, right? This is one fashion which was openly declared, openly declared to have sprung from immoral desire. And for nearly a decade, it was nearly impossible to find anything else on the clothing racks. Now it is 30 years later, more than, it seems like more than that now. And once again, fashion is pushing the miniskirt onto women. Mary Quant, who invented the miniskirt, said, I wanted to have sex with men without having to take my clothes off. So that whole miniskirt is based, the, 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 the person who designed it, it's, it, it was invented upon, based upon lustful desire to attract a man, to lure the man into the bed. You want the truth? I'm going to give you the truth. The miniskirt was designed, the inventor said it out of her own mouth, she wanted to have sex with a man without having to take her clothes off. That miniskirt was made to lure the man into the bedroom. Genesis 3, verse 7. How does God feel about nakedness? How does God feel about this miniskirt? And the eyes of them both were naked. This is after Adam and Eve sinned. The eyes of them both were, were open. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were what? Naked. And what did they do? And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Aprons. That apron wasn't enough. God had to make them coats of skin. Those aprons were basically like skirts. It wasn't enough to cover them. And so the Bible says in Genesis 3, 21, and unto Adam and, and, and also unto Adam also and to his wife, did the Lord God make what? Coats of skin and clothe them. When you wear a coat, that coat covers your limbs. Now, when you look in the original Hebrew, these coats were not like a jacket or something. These coats were basically long flowing robes covering their limbs. When they had their aprons on, it, their limbs were exposed. So when God made the, them coats of skin, he covered their limbs and their bodies to shield them from the, the temperature that would change as a result of sin. To keep them cool in the summer and to keep them warm in the winter. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 49, paragraph 1 says, In humility and inexpressible sadness, Adam and Eve left the lonely garden wherein they had been so happy until they disobeyed, disobeyed the command of God. The atmosphere was changed. It was no longer unvarying as before the transgression. God clothed them with coats of skin to protect them from the sense of chilliness and then of heat to which they were exposed. Romans 12, verse one and two. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, a what? A living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good 
and acceptable and perfect will of God. God wants us to present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable. Wearing a miniskirt, exposing your legs, and, and, and even for the men, sh you know, um, showing your muscular arms and, and wearing these tight muscle shirts. It's not holy and it's not acceptable unto God. Causing women to stumble. Just like women and how they dress can cause a man to stumble. And we see the fashion today, having these women in these tight spandex pants showing the shape of their uh, gluteus maximus and thighs and legs is unholy and unacceptable. Men with these tight, he got men in tight pants now. It's holy, uh, you know, it's unholy and it's unacceptable. God is the owner of the body. And when the body purchased at the infinite cost is made to serve customs, serve the customs and practices of this world by following the fashions of this degenerate age, the testimony is born to the world that pride and sin reign in the heart, that Christ does not abide in the soul temple. Period. The Lord Jesus will not be made to serve with your sins. He claims the undivided throne of the heart and would banish from the life every worldly unsanctified action whose influence would tell against the fact that you are his sons and daughters. This is Youth Instructor, page, Youth Instructor September 14th, 1893, paragraph seven. We must remember that we are the purchase of Christ's blood. Body, soul, and spirit are his, and we are to be his agents and not serve sin and the world. But yield to him that we may be wholly sanctified, abstain from the all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Southern Word, January 15th, 1907, paragraph one. The end is fast approaching and many of our churches are asleep. Let all now make it their chief business to serve the Lord. God has entrusted to his people the talent of means, some more and some less than others. With many, the possession of wealth has proved a snare in their desire to follow the fashions of the world. They have lost their zeal for the truth and they are in peril of losing eternal life. In proportion as God has prospered them, men should return to him of the goods he has entrusted to their stewardship. It's amazing you look at the world. A new pair of Air Force Jordans come out. Air Jordans come out. Shoe costs about three hundred dollars, three hundred something dollars. Long lines at the mall to get this latest shoe. Some people, their whole check is about three, four hundred dollars. Depends on what job that job they have, but typically about three hundred to four hundred something dollars a week, and they spend almost their whole check to get that. New pair, those new pair of Jordans, just so they can, sh you know, have rock, rock their footwear. Just show off their footwork. That's one thing you see it in the world. But when you see in the church individuals who claim to be serving God and they have a whole shoe collection of, uh, and, 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 and they just got to have the latest footwork. Something's wrong. Something's terribly wrong. Their heart is in the wrong place. We're learning lessons from the priest. The priest wore a girdle. So they, they had the, the robe was white, but the girdle that they wore was a fine twine linen, blue, purple, and scarlet 
We've studied this already before. The red points to the blood of Jesus. First John 1 verse 7. The purple points to royalty. God, Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. The blue points to God's law, which is the standard of righteousness. So we must be washed in the blood of Jesus to be a part of this royal priesthood. First John 1 7 says, but if you walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from sin, all sin. First Timothy 6 verse 15, it says, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, King of kings and Lord of lords. James 4 7, submit yourselves therefore to what? God, submit to the king. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. We must allow Christ to reign on the, on the throne of our hearts if we want to be a part of this royal priesthood. Numbers 15, 38 says, Speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they make fr them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations, that they put upon the fringe of the borders a red band of blue. Verse 39 and it shall be unto you for a fringe that ye may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord to do them and that ye seek not after your own heart and your own eyes after which you use to go a whoring. We have to keep the standard of righteousness, which is God's law. Romans seven twelve says, wherefore the law is what? Holy. We want to be a holy generation a holy priesthood, a holy nation, you got to keep God's law, which is holy, which is only possible to keep through the power of Christ dwelling in us. When we receive his righteousness, when we receive Christ into, his, in, into our lives, we receive his righteousness and his righteousness, he empowers us to keep, to walk in his word, to walk in his commandments. Romans 7 verse 12, the Bible says, wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy, just and good. Let's go to first Peter. We've gone through a lot of scriptures this evening. First Peter chapter one, 13 to 16. First Peter one, 13 to 16. It says, wherefore gird up the loins of your mind. We're talking about this girdle, right? There's a spiritual girdle that we need. Gird up the loins of your mind and be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to your former lusts in your ignorance. But as he which have called you is holy, so be holy in all manner of conversation. Conversation does not mean talk, but conversation in original Greek means conduct. In everything that you do, not just in what you speak, but in what you do, everything. It says in verse 16, because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. Gird up the loins of your mind. Arm yourself with the helmet of salvation, the truth of salvation, that Christ can cleanse you from all sin and unrighteousness. Allow Christ, receive him into, a, into your life. Allow him to reign upon the throne of your heart, your mind. Study his word so that you can remember his statutes and his commandments. And the Bible says, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Psalm 119 verse 11. We got to gird the mind because Satan is after the mind, brothers and sisters. We got to guard the mind. Be careful what you're looking at on the television. Guard the mind. There's so many programs that are out there. Guard the mind. Also in what you eat because the stomach is in sympathy with the brain. And if you eat the wrong thing, you will do the wrong thing. You will think the wrong thing. Diet plays a major part in girding up the loins of our mind. So we gotta be careful in what we eat. What we eat affects how we think. So during the reign of David, moving on now, during the reign of David, King David, there were so many priests, so many descendants of Aaron, that King David decided to divide them up, to divide these, these priests up into 24 courses. Each of these courses throughout the year would serve one week 
twice throughout the year. That's your reference right now. We're not going to read it for time's sake. But Zechariah was a part of, the, of, of, of one of these courses, these 24 courses. Zechariah, who was a priest, was of the course of Abijah or Abia. That's, that was the course that he was a part of. You can read that in Luke 1. As a matter of fact, we'll read this one. Luke 1, verses 5 through 9. Luke 1, 5 through 9. We'll read this one. It says here, And there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judah, a certain priest named Zachari Zacharias of the course of Abia. And his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. And they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both were, well, were now well stricken in years. And it came to pass while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his what? Course. According to the custom of the priest's office, his lot or his turn was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. Just want you to see that from the word of God that he was of the course of Abia among these 24 courses of priests. Hebrews 8 verse 4. It says, for if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. Hebrews 8 verse 5, who serve, we, we need to look at the type of this, the antitype rather. We're looking at the type, we need to look at the antitype. Who serve unto the example and shadow of what? heavenly things as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle for see saith he that thou make all things according to the pattern showed thee in the mount 24 courses of priest who does this point to revelation 4 this is a shadow a type of heavenly things right 24 courses remember 24 right revelation 4 verse 4 and 5 The Bible says, and round about the throne were four and 20 seats or 24 seats. And upon the seats, I saw four and 20 or 24 elders sitting clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold and out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunders and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So these 24 courses of priests are tight are a type of the anti-type, the 24 elders. Who are the 24 elders? Revelation 5, verse 8 to 10. Revelation 5, verses 8 through 10. Who are these 24 elders? Revelation 5, verses 8 through 10. The Bible says, and when he had taken, the, this, the lamb, it says, and when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vows full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us by to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God, king and priests, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Kings and priests, the Bible says. And God, the, the, word, the word of God says, thou hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every what? Kindred and tongue and people. These 24 elders are human beings who are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And Christ appointed them as kings and priests. Who are these? Matthew 27. This is based upon my study, who I believe these 24 elders are. I do not believe that they were angels. I don't, I, the Bible tells me in, in Revelation 5 that they say we were redeemed from among men. We 
were redeemed by thy blood. Isn't that what the Bible said? Let me, let me just read it one more time. There's no confusion. Revelation 5. It says in verse 9. And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. These are the 24 elders. Those who are redeemed through the, by the blood of Christ were those who dwell on earth. Not celestial beings. Matthew 27 verses 50 through 53. The Bible says, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent and torn from top to bottom. From top and the bottom. And the earth did quake and the rocks rent. Notice verse 52. And the graves were open and many of the bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. We'll see this again in another study. These were souls when after Christ died, gave up the ghost, the graves are open. And during his resurrection, they were resurrected and they testified of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. These 24 elders were redeemed among men. And the Bible says in Ephesians 4 verse 8, wherefore he said, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. These captives in the grave are sent up to heaven with Jesus. Seven Day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 5, 1109, Paragraph 7. The captives brought up from the graves at the time of the resurrection of Jesus were his trophies as a conquering prince. Thus he attested his victory over death and the grave. Thus he gave a pledge and an earnest of the resurrection of all the righteous dead. Those who were called from their graves went into the city and appeared unto many in their resurrected forms and testified that Jesus had indeed risen from the dead and that he and that they had risen with him. Now, who will one day be translated and resurrected? The Bible says in John 6, verse 40, and this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. These captives who are resurrected when Christ rose from the grave are just a little taste or a sample of the greater resurrection of the righteous that will take place. Those who believe in Christ. First Thessalonians 4 verse 16 and 17 says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall what? Rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord where? In the air. When Christ comes back, he's come, he's not, his feet not going to touch the ground at the second advent. We will meet him in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, what position will these individuals hold in heaven? Revelation 20. Just like these 24 elders were kings and priests, the scripture lets us know that these saints... Who will be ready when Christ returns? They will be kings and priests. This is Revelation 20, 4 and 6. The Bible says, Revelation 24 through 6. And I saw thrones and they that sat up upon them. And judgment was given unto, unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. And which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years, but the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection on such the second death hath no power, but they shall be what? Priest of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Reign, 
kings reign. So they are priests and kings like these 24 elders. Could it be proved who could serve as a priest? Was there a record? Ezra chapter two. Was there a record of who could serve as priest? Ezra chapter two, 61 and 62. Ezra 2, 61, 62 says, And the children of the priests, the children of Habiah, the children of Kaz, the children of Barzila, which took a wife of the daughters of Barzila, the Gileadite, and was called after their name, these sought their register among those who were reckoned by genealogy, but they were not found. Therefore were they as polluted Put from the priesthood. They were not on the record. But see, God also has a record for us, especially those who profess to be a part of his royal priesthood. If you are not on the record, you're not going to be a part of the kingdom. Are you part of the record, brothers and sisters? God has a record. Daniel 7, verse 10. Daniel 7, verse 10. Notice what the Bible says here. Daniel 7, verse 10. And then we're going to go to Revelation 20, verse 15. The Bible says, A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were open. God has a record in heaven. See, these, these things are a type of heavenly things, brothers and sisters. Revelation 20, verse 15. God has a record to show whether you are truly a part of his royal priesthood or not. Revelation 20, verse 15 says, And whosoever was not found written, what's the name of this record? In the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This is the word of God. What must I do in order to be in or remain in the book of life? Exodus chapter 32. The word of God is very clear. Exodus 32, starting at verse 31. It says, and Moses returned. This is after the children of Israel worshiped that golden calf. And Moses saw what was done when he returns back to the Lord. He says this, he's interceding for the people. In verse 31, and Moses returned unto the Lord and said, oh, oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. If you won't forgive them, blot me out of your book. Verse 33. And the Lord said unto Moses, whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book, the book of life. Sin will cause our names to be removed out of the book of life. When our name comes up, shall be found before him wanting or with our sins all washed away. Are you on the record? Are you on the record? It's pardoned written by your name on the record. This will determine who's truly a part of the royal priesthood. We are living in the investigative judgment. And we'll study more on this later. In Daniel 7 verse 10, it says, A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him. And ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were opened. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13 and 14 says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and do what? Keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Why? For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing. Whether it be good or whether it be evil. Great Controversy, page 482, says this. 
Every man's work passes in review, review before God and is registered for faithfulness or unfaithfulness. Opposite each name in the books of heaven is entered with terrible exactness. Every wrong word, every selfish act, every unfulfilled duty, and every secret sin with every artful dissembling. Heaven sent warnings or reproves neglected, wasted moments, unimproved opportunities. The influence exerted for good or for evil with its far-reaching results are all chronicled by the recording angel. God has a record. He has a record. And this record shows whether you are truly a part of God's royal priesthood or you just have a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. If you know you got sin in your life, now is the time to lay it all at the foot of the cross. Now is the time to surrender surrender all to Jesus. As the song says, all to Jesus, I surrender. All to him I freely give. Worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus, take me now. You know how the song goes, but now is the time to make the surrender. Now is the time not to let anything in between your soul and the Savior. Now is the time, friend. Don't procrastinate. As the statement says in Steps to Christ, page 32, paragraph 2, beware of procrastination. Do not put off the work of forsaking your sins and seeking purity of heart through Jesus. Here's where thousands upon thousands have erred to the eternal loss. I will not here dwell upon the shortness and uncertainty of life, but there is a terrible danger, a danger not sufficiently understood in delaying to yield to the pleading voice of God's Holy Spirit in choosing to live in sin. For such this delay really is. Sin, however small it may be esteemed, can be indulged in only at the peril of infinite loss. Notice this last part. Prayerfully consider this. What we do not overcome will overcome us and work out our destruction. Brothers and sisters, now is the time. Not a time to play around anymore. The signs of the times are all around us. It's quite evident that Christ has soon returned. It's quite evident that we are headed to a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. It is quite evident that there, the, the, this world is, is at a state of, of unrest. We see that men's hearts are failing them for fear because of the things that are coming upon the earth. We see the stress of nations with perplexity. This is not a time to play around when we are on the edge of eternity. Are you truly a part of the royal priesthood? Your life will reveal the fact. The record in heaven reveals the fact. But you know what you're dealing with. You know the things that you're struggling with. You know the things that God has told you to let go of, but it's too darling to you. Your darling sin, you don't want to relinquish it. Now it's the time to let it, let it go. Lay it at the foot of the cross. God is not asking you to change your heart because you can't do it. You surrender to him and let him do it. This is the time. It's preparation time. Now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus. Help us, Lord, in these last days to be a part of your royal priesthood, to relinquish any sin that may be in our lives that's not of you. This is preparation time. This is the time to make sure that we are right with you. This is not a time to doubt our experience. This is a time where we need to really Examine ourselves to really know where we stand. So, Lord, be with each and every one of us. Be with every listener. Help us in all that we do to truly be a part of your royal priesthood. In Jesus' name, amen. 
If you have any topic or question, please comment below. Thank you for your prayers and continued support.